Now, we went to our first information meeting in Roscommon, and there was 560 people around in Mart. And we spoke the truth, we explained the plan to them, and there was huge appreciation that somebody was going to try and do something for beef farmers. And after that, it just mushroomed. Uh, huge crowds everywhere we went. People wanted to be part of this. People believed in this. People believed in the plan and the people that set it up. And it just was an animal that was out of control. This is Hugh Doyle here with Eamon Corley. We've decided to, um, to draft a video to explain uh, to the farmers of Ireland who may have only heard uh, half of the story regarding the problems in beef plan. We're doing a video with the intention of explaining to farmers exactly what's happening in beef plan at the moment. I'm not strong on social media, I'm not on Twitter, I'm not on Facebook. Uh, I don't read a lot of WhatsApp messages. Uh, I think it's important for you to, make, to be able to make a proper informed decision. I think you need to hear both sides of the story. And I think you haven't been he hearing both sides of the story. And I'm going to tell you along with Eamon the truth. I will not be running as the national chair in the next elections. So what you're going to hear from me is from my heart. And I think that's important so that people can move forward. It's important that everybody, I think, knows the truth of what's actually happening at Beef Plan and, and the way we want it to go forward. Well, I, I suppose Beef Plan, it was born out of desperation uh, among beef and suckler farmers because nobody was really representing them. The people who were representing them, they weren't really in it with passion and weren't taking the thing seriously. It was like a side issue for them. So, so what we done was, we got a group of beef farmers, initially in Mead, myself and Hugh Doyle and a few more, and, and it mushroomed. Uh, and it started probably with about 300 people who communicated through social media, uh, using social, um, a form of social media called WhatsApp and, and many other, other things to communicate. We came up with this 86 point plan and seven different phases and the idea was uh, the two main points of it were number one to cut down on your input costs uh, through something like a purchasing group and number two to get more for your produce with something like a producer group and we, we also decided to tackle the cartels, the anti-competitive practices Basically, we got farmers to stand up for themselves, and this new organisation was to give farmers a voice. And it, it was to be totally from the grassroots up, and was to be inclusive of everybody. Uh, shippers, stakeholders, tagus, all these bodies, and farmers, uh, but led from the grassroots up. And that really is what the plan was. I'm a full-time farmer. Uh, it's the only income in the house. I think, Eamon, you're a full-time... Yeah, I'm a full-time suckler farmer and, uh, and every animal then has finished the beef. So I, I, I have a lot of experience in both suckler farming and finishing animals. And again, it's, it's my full-time uh, full income. It's the only income for a household. So uh, I'm totally engrossed in farming issues and beef farming issues. Uh, I was a member of the IFA. I'm not now. I have. Uh, there have been some accusations regarding uh, that I potentially was trying to amalgamate uh, beef plan with the IFA. Under no circumstance would I ever envisage beef plan ever being uh, uh, amalgamated with another farm organisation. The reason we set up beef plan was because the IFA, as far as we were concerned, was not fit for purpose. And just my involvement with the IFA. Um, I was a member for a good few years and basically we, I, I would have went to sort of the NAV and AGM, which would be one meet in a year. Uh, I, I later got elected as the beef representative for Mead and I, I went to a couple of the IFA national beef meetings. Uh, at that stage I, I had the beef plan together and I, I was, the, the initial um, theory was to present it to the IFA and the IFA would endorse this plan. 
But what they actually told me was that, that they would only be looking to implement maybe two points of the plan. And I realised at that stage that the IFA wasn't going to work for beef farmers. It's not correct. As I said, there was a loose arrangement to, to elect the county committees. These county committees then were supposedly involved in electing th this new temporary national committee. But what actually happened was some counties it was just phone calls made, others it was WhatsApp conversations. So, so they weren't democratically elected. No, they weren't. The reality is that that temporary national committee didn't work very well. Uh, a, a lot of counties felt excluded. The, the information wasn't being fed back. Um, it, it, it was no longer a grassroots organisation. So the ideas from the members weren't coming up and weren't being implemented at the top. Um, a lot of bad decisions were made where, where the co-chairs weren't consulted. Um, for an example, the protests at the factory gates were called off uh, and neither myself nor Hugh Doyle were involved in the decision. Uh, th there was an agreement by the temporary national committee, or, or it, it was announced publicly that people who took part, farmers who took part in the protests would be expelled from the organisation. Um, it, it was decided that the people that got injuncted while standing at the factory gates uh, would not have legal representation from beef plan. Um, it, it was also decided that when the people with injunctions went to court, that nobody from beef plan should go up and support them. Like neither of the co-chairs were, were consulted in that. In, in fact, myself and Hugh Doyle, Hugh Doyle did organise for those people to be represented. He, he, he got lambasted by uh, those people uh, to stood down to the, the former national committee for doing that. Also, myself and Hugh Doyle, completely out of our own human nature, went up to support those people. And it, they also attacked us for doing that. Um, it, it was also decided that we would exclude shippers, we would exclude cattle dealers, and, and various other stakeholders from Beef Plan. Uh, to me, that went against the inclusion policy in Beef Plan. Uh, and I think there are a lot of mistakes that uh, that temporary national committee has made. The, the factory protest started and farmers got involved and gave it their all and, and for two weeks um, done a huge amount of work uh, setting up protests in the factories. Uh, then what happened was a, a decision was taken to stand down the factory protests uh, and a lot of people would feel that it wasn't a democratic decision. Um, maybe you'd like to come in on that, Hugh. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, when the first set of protests started, uh, after about a week, uh, Beef Plan would have got uh, legal threats from the various factories. Uh, and a decision was made at national level to, to stand down the protests. Now, I was completely in disagreement with this, but because democracy had to had to be obeyed, I had to stand in behind the National Committee. I genuinely thought we showed a, a, a weakness. I think when the B Plan members were contacted and told that they would be expelled if they went out on any other protests, I think that was the wrong decision. Uh, when the second set of protests uh, happened, they happened simply because farmers felt abandoned by B Plan. And I think we need to be aware of what the grassroots farmer thinks. And I think if, if we're more concerned about uh, the potential uh, legal threat, there is a fine line. And I think Beef Plan were, were a little bit overcautious. Uh, in fact, I know they were overcautious uh, when the... the when we removed ourselves from the picket line. Personally, I, I didn't agree with it. Yeah, I, I think that led on to a lot of other questionable decisions that were taken. Uh, as Hugh says, calling off the protest in the first place, I think it was premature. Uh, two prominent members then, Owen Donnelly and Dermot Bryan, coming out and saying uh, on August the 9th or shortly after when the protests ended that they were going to expel members who took part in the 
uh, in, in the protest was was very damaging to beef plan and um, very hurt, hurtful to the farmers that were on the pickets. Yeah, hurtful to uh, the farmers who were basically sleeping in trailers for maybe a four to four weeks. You know, to have someone say that about them, mm. um, farmers still do not forgive them for that. Farmers who went out the second time and got involved in, in the factory protest because they felt they had to, uh, some of them ended up getting injuncted. And Hugh Doyle felt it, it was important that those people be represented uh, at court. Well, the majority of them were Beef Plan members. Uh, they had felt abandoned by Beef Plan. Uh, and I personally felt the Beef Plan were weak. Uh, we ran to the hills as soon as we got uh, a legal threat. Uh, uh, we had farmers who were standing on the picket lines prepared to to uh, risk their liberty. I mean, to, to potentially put yourself on the line and potentially go to prison. I mean, that takes, that's the sort of guts that we want in Beef Plan. We don't want weakness. We don't want people uh, just because there's a legal threat. Now, you have to be cognizant of the legal threat, but you, I mean, at the time we had the legal threat, I got another alternative viewpoint and I was told that we were being ultra cautious. And then to come out and say that the uh, members were going to be expelled and uh, when the injunctions uh, for some of these farmers that were on the picket lines, uh, when they were being uh, called to the four courts, I said to the National Committee that I was going down to the four courts to support them. They told me if I did that there would be repercussions and I said, that's fine, gentlemen, I'm going, I'm going anyhow. And I went down uh, because these were guys that potentially could have been going to prison. And for God's sake, people need to realise that they are the, the, the ground troops that we represent. Uh, and there was no way that I wasn't going to, to stand in line with them. Yeah, well, I suppose it's important to recognise that a farmer spent as much as maybe four, six weeks lying in trailers outside factory gates. Mm. And to think that um, Beef Plan wouldn't provide legal representation for those people, yeah. I think was horrific. And I think fair play to Hugh, we did organise that for those well, people. Well, I, I, I contacted the, the National Committee and I said that we'd have to stand in. And they said if, if we stood in, we would definitely be injuncted because the, the, uh, the factories would know. Uh, and uh, one person said to me uh, that if, uh, as a result of the farmers, if they break the law, they've to, they've to suffer the consequences. Uh, and I said, by God, lads. Uh, so I managed to get a, a person from another farm organization who volunteered uh, to help our fellow farmers because at the end of the day they were fellow farmers I didn't care whether they were what from whatever farm organization they were the people on the line gambling their 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 liberty and what I can say is that myself and you we didn't communicate with each other just out of the goodness in our hearts mm. we decided to go up to the four courts that day and just to be there for those people and the Slaney, I, Slaney I, six, I, yeah. I, I'm actually glad that I did because um, those lads came over and shook my hand for being there. Yeah. So, so I think they appreciated that someone who had their interest at heart what was there just to show support. I mean, the IFOI, that stemmed from the fact that beef plan were weak. And I mean, we, listen, when you make a mistake, you put your hands up. We, we were wrong. We were wrong. And anybody who, t who tries to tell me that beef plan was correct in taking that line as a result of the legal threat, well, I would argue till the cows come home. Um, I suppose other things that were done that, that weren't great, this whole business of excluding people, excluding people like shippers, excluding people like cattle dealers uh, and other uh, stakeholders in the industry. Uh, also this whole business of the letter that, that was sent to the British retailers saying that we, uh, that the farmers feeding cattle under 30 months were basically force feeding them. That, that done huge damage. Uh, to Beef Plan as an organisation. 
I mean, if I if I can just come in there, uh, the the email that was sent to the English retailers, uh, that was done completely uh, without my knowledge, as as the chairman of of B Plan, uh, I was contacted by the Farmers Journal, and it was the first I heard of it. I was asked for a comment. Uh, I mean, if if you have a national committee, and and they don't um, they don't consult. There was other members of the national committee that that didn't hear about uh, this email. You, you put we potentially could have damaged uh, our Irish exports to England uh, in in a huge way. The, the, I mean, the 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 other exporters into England they would grab onto that with both hands, and I was actually embarrassed to think that somebody within our organisation would make that decision, take it upon themselves, ignore the chair and send that out. I think, I think it was un unforgivable. And just another thing on that, Hugh, is, is the link between the grassroots members and the organisation. I think during that period, that link was basically cut. Like one, one, another example of that was when the points to go into the task force were agreed uh, they didn't come from the grassroots members and a lot of grassroots members felt that they weren't actually represented at that meeting because of that. 